Hello, I'm Laura Furiosi, divorce mother of three, and I'm here with my mother, Lynette Galvin, with 35 years' experience in family law. You're listening to the Divorce Course Podcast. Through our candid discussions, we hope to help you through your divorce or de facto separation. We will be answering the most commonly asked questions and covering the stages and steps that you will face on your way to freedom. Have you left a coercive controlling relationship but found that it followed you? Today's episode is part two of the 12 signs of coercive control after separation and what you can do about it. Welcome, Mum. Hello, Laura. Hi, everyone. Now, we aim to do the 12 signs of coercive control and separation and what you can do about it but we only got up to six. So we're doing a two-parter. So if you're listening to this one now, please, you can listen to this if you want first and then jump back to the one that was before this one. And you can actually scroll down to the show notes and click the link if you can't find it or just DM us. So mum, we'll just quickly go through the first six. I'll just list them out and then we'll go into them. So number one, we talked about isolating you from your support system, which continues after, monitoring your activity throughout the day, denying you freedom and autonomy, gaslighting, name calling and putting you down, threatening your children or pets. Then we've got number seven. Before we start, just to remind everybody, this coercive control signs, they're everywhere at the moment because there's new amendment bills going through all over the place, all over the world. Uh, Queensland has the Criminal Law Coercive Control and Affirmative Consent Amendment Bill from 2023. Uh, I know New South Wales, I think Tasmania has coercive control laws. So it's it's really coming in to its, its life, but there is not much discussion around the coercive control that continues after separation. And when it comes to after separation, coercive control, one of the biggest post-separation abuse things we see is that legal abuse and how it filters into dealing with lawyers and co-parenting. So that's what we're touching on today. So the number seven sign is limiting your access to money. So when you're in the relationship, maybe you were given a wage by your ex. Maybe they had a credit card that they controlled. Mm -hmm. Maybe they had rules on what you could spend on what you couldn't. But after separation, in your head, you would think, well, logically, to anyone who hasn't been a coercive control relationship, well, once you've left the relationship, you spend your money any way you want. So, Mm -hmm. mum, how does that coercive control of money continue after separation? Well, I think one of the the ways is direct control, direct um, Usually just after separation, you haven't got child support in place if there's children. Someone's got to pay that mortgage. Mm. Someone's got to pay for the car payments, credit card payments and all. If your ex is in a superior position financially, they're better off. They may say, look, that's it. You can pay those by yourself now. It's in your name, by the way. Like, you know, they can sort of do what a kind of working to the rule of the law and make you feel very vulnerable about that you might lose your home, Mm. uh, that you might end up on the streets that you can't afford the mortgage. That's one way, the Mm. kind of indirect way that might cut off your medical benefits, private health insurance, because they'll put, leave them and the kids on if there's kids. And it's no extra to have a second adult, they're but just, they just do it to be. They're just poopy bums. Yeah, poopy bums. The other way they do it is by manipulating the amount of child support they pay. They say, you know, it's up there with don't go to the lawyers. It's your your first option with child support from the point of view of the child support agency is private collection Mm. so that you do it just between yourselves. And that gives scope for a coercively controlling person to delay the payment or let you think you're not going to get it. So if you're living pretty hand to mouth and Mm. you're waiting on child support, they may put it in two days late if you haven't agreed to something they've said. And that checking your phone, checking your app, going to the bank to see if the money's gone in yet, is them controlling you because they choose when to give it next time. So when they give you an ultimatum next month about doing something, you'll go, I better do it because I won't get my child support on time. So if they find out you're dating someone Ugh. and they just stop paying child support mm-hmm. that week or month because they're angry at you. So there's that controlling aspect. Yeah. And then then the other side, Mum, I guess, is that the, the property settlement, just in, yeah. just in divorce alone, the non-disclosure, the hiding Absolutely. of money. Yeah. I think we had a listener who's written in and actually uh, a member as well where there's this new trick and mum and I have found a book by the way that we're going to do a oh whole gosh. episode on and it is literally a handbook written by some person on what to do to how like it's I'm, terrible. I'm going to need more than a cup of tea but to read that. <laughs> we're going to need all the chocolate and all the tea but what it has in there yeah. is the step-by-step way to hide your asset. And one of our members has written in recently and there is a new trend going around on what to do with your super to hide. So there's this behaviour that seems 
totally acceptable in that world of hiding your assets. If you know you're going to break up with your wife or your husband in the next year, get everything prepared, run all your money down, don't accept what increases in your wage. So so there is a strategy in place, mum, for people to manipulate their financials so that their property settlement is lower, which is controlling financial abuse. Also, yeah. And you will get less if they've managed to hide the assets. So that's what they're trying to do. Mm. And delaying, like you're saying, disclosure. And it seems to me that they will, through their lawyers, like bully you and accuse you of stuff that you so, haven't done. So is that recognised by the family court yet? Doing that kind of non-disclosure, hiding money, is that recognised by the court at all? It is once you find it. Right. So the first thing people need to know, if they're hiding money, It's come from somewhere usually and find, like you might see money going going out of your bank account or whatever. You don't have to prove where that money went. They have to prove what they did with it. And so So you you just just have to go, there's money missing. Absolutely. Show me where it went or it goes back in the property. And the very fact of dragging court cases out might serve an abuser because they may be prepared to pay anything to keep you thinking about them Mm. and to keep being able to control you. I know where she's going to be on the 12th of January. She's going to be in court because I dragged her there. Yeah. And I've had people on the other side, they have positive balances in the credit card so Mm -hmm. that you might have a credit card limit of Mm 3,000. They put 3,000 in the account and at a quick glance when they give you those things, it looks looks like like it's it's, balanced. It's the balance, yes, but actually there's a positive amount. Sometimes they put extra money in a betting accounts. So if, if you are struggling with that, disclosure, hiding. We've got an episode called DIY Disclosure where mum talks you through her strategies of what she does to go looking for that stuff. Yeah. And there are really severe penalties now in the court since the amendment of the rules in 2021 Mm -hmm. for people who don't play by the rules in disclosure. Mm -hmm. And in fact, one of the registrars in the Brisbane Registry has put case names at the bottom of his directions, suggesting that everyone reads them to see how seriously the court is taking non-disclosure or non-compliance with steps that are ordered. And ultimately, I think the court is going to order costs against those people and maybe even go to a final trial and make assumptions about their assets. That won't be helpful. Well, to is the is person. to make people feel a little bit better. I've read you've sent me some mm. stuff. They're thinking about adding in that kind of uh, like an, an understanding if they're being sneaky with their money mm. that their per- a larger percentage of the property pool will be attributed. Yes, there's case law to that okay. effect. Yeah, right. and the case law is we would say say a hundred thousand dollars worth of stock is missing mm-hmm. when you do that. It doesn't marry up. The court will, I think, will t- take it in and add it in as though it's still there Mm -hmm. and then attribute it all to the other person that they've already had that much and then divide the rest of the assets accordingly. So So an important thing for anyone listening, because a lawyer understands this, but Mm. lay people don't. If you go, oh, they went on this big fancy holiday and spent all this money, oh, they took all this money out and I don't know where it went, and you're filling in the financial boxes, you can write. Mm. There was this much money question mark what it was spent on. Or you know, Make sure you let your lawyer know. Don't just go, oh, that's a write-off. No. Tell your lawyer and say, this money was in there, it's gone missing. Keep banging on about it um, as long as you need to because if they have evidence to the contrary to say, no, I didn't waste it on that trip or I didn't put my money in a hidden account, then they need to produce it. They need to show what did happen to that money. And so that little table turning thing, it, it's the court's keen on it because it moves cases through quickly. But so many people write in and say, we've got mediation in two weeks and they haven't done their disclosure or they've done like a half-hearted job, but they feel like they have to do the mediation. Mm. What do you say? You really don't have to if you don't know what you're mediating about. And it might be serving the coercive control person to have you there and then just say no. So your lawyer should refer them to the central practice direction, look at the procedures. We might put those two cases in. Okay, Laura, we'll the put the cases in the show notes. And, you know, frighten the socks off the other side mm. for not doing it because it may be ultimately the ultimate punishment is an, un- is an undefended hearing. That means they don't get to put any evidence in. You can say what you think and the court will give you the re- outcome. So the court's really down on people who drag the chain. I'd like to think it's because of the coercive control element, but Mm. I don't think it is. I think it's because the court wants these matters dealt with quickly and they're not prepared to sit it in the system. The Chief Justice 
did say in a press release that he is cognizant or he's aware of the terrible impact on mostly women but on families of prolonged cases and maybe in that discussion or that description he is aware of the women that are being exposed or the men to coercive control by the process but whatever the reason is you it's a good and you. the court are both in the same hmm. same base both wanting to do the same thing and your ex will be in the minority. So if you are listening to this, again, this is legal education. Mm -hmm. This is just education for community. So please go out, seek legal advice, and then take action. So don't take any action based off what we've said today, because mum is a lawyer, yes, but she's not your lawyer. Mm. Every situation is different, but this is just to give you some peace of mind in a way and and some action to take. All right. So definitely limiting your access to money is a biggie. It is. It's a biggie, but it can also be, you know, some examples of financial control. So if you've got documentation where they've said, I'm only giving you money this week if you do X, Y, Z. brilliant. Write it down, screenshot it, capture it, email it to your your email that you've created for yourself. Oh, yes, for for your court stuff. For your documentation, Mm -hmm. for your court stuff, and keep that so that you can provide that later to say, here's some evidence of coercive control and financial abuse. Mm. All right, let's go on to the next one, which is a bit weird, this one. So it's 12 signs of coercive control. Number eight, reinforcing traditional gender roles. Mm. How does this follow on? And I I can already tell (laughs) how this follows on after separation. And there's a big, shiny everybody, this term co-parenting and everyone's kumbayaring and holding hands. Let's co-parent together. The problem is, mum, if you were living together, and you were the one who was doing all the child caring, yes. all the cooking, all the cleaning, all the everything, then you separate. Your ex doesn't miraculously all of a sudden take on those roles. In some regards, afterwards, they expect you to continue doing those roles. Yes, and you would because you yes. love your children. Of course. Sometimes they might take up with another more nurturing type of person and mm. they might do some of these things. But generally, traditional gender roles Mm. do include the mothering, do include cooking and the housework and and so forth. And it excludes a woman having a job outside the house. Mm. And so one of the things that I've seen happen post-separation is both parents are working, the children are in some sort of 50-50 arrangement, but the one who, I guess the father, refuses to get involved if for some reason the kids can't go to school or you get called up to the school. Mm. So they've just sort of made sure that they've got maybe equal times or whatever they can get so that their child support's down but low. But equal and load. They're up, But they're not equally responsible. And mm. And what they can do is just not answer the school phone calls. And another trick that people have written into us about to, to be mindful of if you haven't settled or you have got haven't got orders mm. yet is you don't want to have orders that say the mother will upload copies of the report cards, the mother will, mother or father. You don't want to be put in charge of the children's admin and be held accountable on a court order for that sort right. of stuff because that's that's really not fair. Yep. And there's another way of controlling. There is. Yeah, it is. And and so they, the orders used to say that because the mother would traditionally have a little more time mm. than the father, so the mother would ensure that copies of these documents. Now we d- don't do that, guys. So There might be do, still some lawyers that have that in maybe, their precedence. But ask them perhaps, is it, is, would it be better for this? Because I've seen the court judges change the orders to this. Good. And it's something like uh, along the lines of this order is authority for the children's schools or and medical providers if you wanted them to be able to access medical records mm-hmm. um, to uh, provide to, bo- to both parents the information required. And then um, you could set up a special email for those sort of documents. Mm. Some people some, I think some people are a bit horrified if they haven't had much of a role in raising the children and suddenly they've got either weak about or maybe a bit more, a bit less than that. Suddenly they actually have to do things like mm. take the child to cricket mm. and read these things News because letters. they might get book week wrong yes. or whatever. So yes. um, sometimes you may have to prompt them a little bit. Mm. But, yes, don't – if that sort of order gets you off the hook Yes, and, and it doesn't need you then to say – Oh, by the way, don't forget book week next week. Mm. However, for the sake of the children, you might might do that. Yeah. And you might say, look, it's Johnny's but, book week next week. So in that coercive controlling, they're, they're trying to use that traditional gender role to continue to control you. So if you're, say, for example, they're saying, well, 
I wasn't there, send me a video, send yes. me a summary, send you me guess, a report, yeah, what send happened? me a detailed account. So how do people get themselves out of that? Mindset. Um, Mindset. Yeah. Do you uh, have to? Do you have to do that? Well, it depends what your orders say. Okay. But maybe you say, have a look for yourself. Mm. You know, just count Here's it. the link. Because they will use those letters of asking you stuff and you not responding. They mm. may use that in court. So just write back and say, here's the link, here's yeah. the link, here's yeah. the link, so that you don't get involved in an obligation to report them and, and a conversation where they then can ask you more questions and then can, be, can argue every point. Mm. It's so frustrating, though, because those people are saying, I, I feel like that's a second admin job for me now to keep the other parent up to speed to keep them in the loop about things that they could go and find for themselves. Well, but it's about the best interests of the children and it's got to be easier than living with them, right? True. But <laughs> so. in saying that, you flip that, Mum, the best interests of the children, that other parent should learn how to log into the system, should learn how to read the newsletter. But, you know, little kids should have some block on, right? I think we all yes. agree. Kids yes. should have some block on. Until the little kid learns to put it on themselves, we put it on for them. Yes. So think of your ex as, as a, a little, little, little kid who needs some block. Yes. And so you can do that for him until he gets his he or she aware he or she gets aware enough to do it for themselves. Mm. Yeah. So I get you keep that aspect of best interest of your children, but mm. then remembering, you know, it you can educate them on how to do it. You mm. can give them maybe you could have a have a how to <laughs> have a log into the school system. Here's your password, here's your username, well, click on this. Yeah, but but at the end of the day, one thing you definitely don't want to happen is for your child to turn up. Not at dressed school, up at Book Week. Not dressed up at Book Week. Yeah. Or to feel different or less mm. than. Yeah. You know, and if the other person's going to be carrying on a big sooky thing about it, mm-hmm. um, then maybe you do it anyway. Yeah. You know, so yeah. you both, uh, we just want to get that little one through. Yeah. Uh, it's not their being fault. Exposed. That's you right. Made a choice to yeah. marry someone who's a poopy bum. Well, yes, but your child. Is that's a lovely said. child. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's not their fault. Okay, so number nine, turning your kids against you. Now, this is a huge thing on the internet as well, a massive mm. thing, and we're not talking about parental alienation no. here because it's not a psychological rec- recognised thing. It's no. not in the psychologist handbook, but there is times when, especially right at the beginning, yeah. where the coercive controlling parent will say things like, your mother, your father did this to me and I'm yeah. so sad. I don't want to leave. I've got nowhere to go. Yes, um, I'm being forced to leave you. Yeah. So, so there's all these kind of horrible things that they can say to your children that can make them go, oh. You know, they're things you wouldn't dream of saying to a child mm. um, unless you were unevolved mm, <laughs> as mm. a parent and a person. Mm. And so uh, if they are saying that, that should reinforce your decision to leave them, not make it less. And the kids, but how do you protect them from that? Well, you just tell them to stop it for a start. Yeah, oh, I like stop. that. Definitely stop uh, it. I've had a case where they decided to tell the children together that they were going to separate. Mm-hmm. And then while one of them was out getting groceries, the other one already told the kids. <gasps> yeah. Uh, don't do group chats with you and him and the kids or you and her and the kids because there's a little opportunity for the kids to get sucked into that. So they know the evidence of their own feelings and of their own eyes. You can't say, no, that's not true. Daddy's left me for another woman or mum's decided she wants another job. You can't do that because their eyes will glaze over and they don't know what who does, to believe. What does the court think about it if someone oh, pulled their kid up and said, oh, from, your mother did this to me? So what does the court think about it? The court it? hates it. Okay, Absolutely so how do you prove it? hates it. How do you prove usually, this to the court? Usually, they, they, usually the kids will say in, in the, the family, the family report. report or sometimes the person who does it admits it in an affidavit. So they don't. I've spoken to the children and they don't understand why the mother would, you know, so that they inadvertently put it in their material. Well, I ask the kids what they want. Yeah. Do they want to live with me? And, of course, the child in front of you is going to not want to hurt your feelings and say, oh, of course I want to live. But you shouldn't be asking those no, questions don't to the that. children. And don't let the kids think they can make that decision. So that comes out in a family report. It does. It does. What about if you f- can you provide evidence? Usually, again, in this world of, of uh, digital world where so they've got messages and If Facebook. the court doesn't like it, what are the outcomes or the okay. effect, what does the court do about it? Well, the court will say that the person who does that is not child-focused. Right. 
And that is a feature, Mm -hmm. being child-focused, of the ideal parent in the court's eyes or the good enough parent. They've got to be child-focused. If you're not child-focused and you demonstrate it that way, then the court may limit the children's exposure to a person who's going to discuss the proceedings. So let's, let's, when a person is not child-focused, they're basically focused on themselves. That's right. So if you... No, sorry, not just focus on themselves, so focused on you, your ex, Mm. that they hate you or they want to control their kids. Yes, Mm. which is a horrible thing for children to be in. But so you provide that to, like, if that Mm. evidence comes through to the court, they say that parent's not child-focused, therefore they Mm. limit the access. And and you'll see in the communications um, between the parents uh, that one parent will be bullying sometimes and, and haranguing and using it to point score rather than focusing on the health of the children. Yeah. And so, yeah, the, it does come out. But from you, you're, for you with this post-suppression, don't take it personally if the kids say, oh, you never cooked properly for us or I've never had a proper cheese, a cheesecake before, you never made it, or, you know, um, I like the way Daddy does my hair more. And mm. just say, that's lovely, darling. Yeah. And, and just keep on keeping on because the kids will work it out mm-hmm. and if they don't work it out that their father or mother is horrible, that's great. Yes. <laughs> that's the better outcome. All right, so we need to talk about the elephant in the room mm-hmm. and that is the coercive controller's use of parental alienation. Now, I know we've got listeners who feel that they, their children have been alienated from them through bad mouthing and, and mm. bad stories told, and I believe that those people, that is happening to them. Yeah. But there is, and it, it's it's in that book we found yeah, at God, the op shop, that book. <laughs> that book that says that sometimes allegations of abuse is is parental alienation. Yes. So there is a chance if you are coming out of a coercive controlling relationship and you're in the in the legal system that they are going to play the parental alienation card yes. on you. Yeah. And that's a typical coercive control thing. My kids don't want to see me therefore it's your fault. Yeah. And everything that the children do wrong is your fault because you're alienating them. But the reality is Are you living separated under one roof or are you about to leave your partner? Please go and download our free Before You Go checklist, a list of things that have been created by Lynn Galvin, a family lawyer specialist of 35 years, of all the things she wished her clients had collected before they'd left. Save yourself a lot of money, subpoena heartache and drama and disclosure issues by doing this checklist before you go. If say, go to www.thedivorcecourse.com.au and click on Before You Go checklist. Um, I think... Mm -hmm. in my experience, is that if a child has two parents who they love, Mm -hmm. then it's it's pretty well impossible to tell them anything wrong about the other parent. If they're not seeing one parent and the other person is filling them with these stories, it may work for a while, uh, but ultimately the kid's own reality asserts itself Mm. and says no. It goes back to you. when this parental alienation thing is used, this card is used against people coming out of a coercive controlling relationship and maybe the kids genuinely are fearful of that parent or they Mm. genuinely dislike that person because they are so controlling and abusive. How does that wash out in court? It's pretty hard to prove. Are there lots of... Well, to prove the alienation or to prove that the reason the kids don't like the parents is because of their because behaviour. Yeah, because she's awful to them. Yeah, yeah. so that's lived experience. Yes. Uh, sometimes in the family report that comes out as mm-hmm. to why they don't like, sometimes the kids can't enunciate it mm-hmm. or they are told this is going to be read by your mother mm. So and they don't say what they want to say, mm. you know. So it's, it's it comes out very sort of gently, I guess. So and, ha- and the court does, though, the children have a genuine desire to, it's either to spend more time with the parent or to spend, or it's they don't want to spend more time with the parent. You know, it's it's those two things. And the court weighs it up. So the children's wishes are an element in the Family Law Act that the court has a look at. And they have regard to the ages of the children and what influences have been on them. So the kids will generally be able to, well, they'll if they go into a family report writer and they parrot off a whole list of sins of the other parent that they actually don't have knowledge, like he used to 
bash mummy. Well, did you ever see that? No, mummy said, or you know, he made us move out of our house. Then the court can see that that's a narrative being fed by the by one parent against the other parent, mm. and that might be cause for the court to not listen to the children's wishes. Mm. Yeah, but generally, I think you know, generally the children love both parents. And so it's it's really almost impossible to to make them hate someone, one yeah. of their parents. And that's why, I mean, in years gone by, where there would be like a break from the parent that was alienating them, if that was a thing. I know it's not a thing, but mm. it's it's in it's not in the act in words, mm. but it does still come up as a concept. So what's a way people can protect themselves from the alienation accusation? Well, first of all, don't discuss things with the kids so they don't report you saying things to them. Number one, yep. yep. Secondly, and this is going to stick in the craw, no matter how angry you are with this other person, how disappointed you are, you need to write every message to them as though it's going to be read out in open court by their barrister to the judge, mm -hmm. okay, and you need to almost bend over backwards to be accommodating um, while at the same time honouring uh, your children's protection and safety. Now, as the kids get older, the courts listen to them more. So the Family Law Act used to say 14. I've said this before now. It doesn't say 14, but they the court looks at the wishes of children, probably from about 13 on, as almost determinative, as almost they will follow their wishes, mm. mainly because the kids can get on the train and go back to the other house. So mm. they're not going to make orders against for now, kids who could run away. And before we go on, everybody's legal situation is different. Mm. There's so many moving parts. So this is just education. Go and see a lawyer to make sure that that is what is going to yeah. happen in your situation. So mm. don't rely on this podcast to help you in that that's regard. Good. So yeah. that's just the sort of thing that I yeah. would say. Once I look at the facts, mm. um, I may well say that, you know, it's, it's unlikely mm. that a 13-year-old, 14-year-old, 15-year-old, 16-year-old is going to be made to go somewhere they don't want to go. To the point... I think that's understood by most people. Mm. And I do did hear a story of a judge going off his rock, <laughs> um, yelling at a, a person who was trying to force time with a 16-year-old child mm. and he's saying that, you know, that's not appropriate. Mm. So I don't know. And on, Look, the flip, 15, on, yeah, on the flip side, you know, when, when it's all said and done and your kids are older yeah. and they're in their 20s and 30s, like, you know, there's always the, oh, where are we going to go for Christmas? Are we going to go yeah. to dads? Are we going to go to mums? You know, all of that is going to continue moving forwards anyway, but that it's not going to be court ordered who goes to dad or mums when they're 20 for Christmas. And then that is when yeah. it's going to come out in the wash. You know, if you have been through abuse, if you have, if your children have suffered, you know, they're probably most likely eventually going to come to the realisation that that was abusive and not go and spend Christmas with them when they're 20. Yep. So childhood is a short amount of time. It is. It and is. if you can limit the, the, the harm and the risk and, and yep. have presented everything you can to the court, the court will most likely make a decision that is in the best interest of the children. And hopefully, you know, with your guidance and their help, uh, the court's help, they'll get come through the their side. childhood safely and come out as, as adults and make Balanced their own adults. decisions. Yes. And and I think the, the real success of a person helping their children not, I guess, have the children's wishes on it, mm -hmm. but don't get into the fight so yeah. that they don't end up having to hate one parent, love one yes. parent, yeah. is a better, that, that outcome's to be much desired mm. so that the children know their parents, both of them, warts and all, mm -hmm. as Judge Bell used to say, and they might have to grit their teeth to spend Christmas with one of the parents, but they do it out of because they have an okay relationship with both parents yep. or okay relationship with one and a wonderful relationship with the other. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's, yeah, you just don't need them growing up with complex trauma yes. as a result of the legal system or, or as a result of, yeah, the separation. So, look, that is a yucky topic and we don't really like touching on it too much but mm. because everybody's situation is different and it is it's it sounds a bit preachy to come from someone who's not going through what your particular circumstances mm. are to tell you, you know, to, to do whatever it is that you need to do. So everybody's situation is different. Go and see a lawyer, go speak to your psychologist and understand that, you know, we're not telling you anything here. We're just exploring the issue. Okay. So, so mum, let's move on then to the signs of coercive control number 10, mm. controlling aspects of your health and body. Now you would think, you would think that that would stop when you left. Yeah. But coercive control, controlling aspects of your health and body doesn't stop no. if that's continued, that separation abuse through 
subpoenaing your psychologist notes. Absolutely. Uh, Cancelling your health insurance. Insurance. Isolating you maybe if you had a physio that you had jointly. You know, so there's, oh, there are all these things that they can getting do. The, getting the family doctor on their side. Yeah. Kind of telling everybody that you need mental health mm. um, intervention, that you're mad, mm. you're crazy, you don't love me anymore, you must be mad. So and- what, do you, what do you say to those people mm-hmm. who who maybe they've seen a psychologist and maybe they're worried that their notes are going to be subpoenaed so they don't go and see a psychologist? Like what what things are in place in the law at the moment yep. to help protect people from that worry of controlling yes. intrusion from your ex being yes. able to read basically well, a diary? Ah, uh, it is, isn't it? And you won't get proper help if you can't tell everything yeah. to them. So to, I think there's something coming along the line about people not being able to, litigants in person, not being able to read those health files. Mm -hmm. I think the judges can read them still Yes, if you ask them to. It's it's not helpful uh, if you've got to hold stuff back Mm. because you know it might be subpoenaed later. I think you need to get the mental health that you need. Maybe you can keep the counselling sessions to be only about what's going on now Mm. rather than historical. I think sometimes you could change psychologists or family therapists or whoever so that that can't be, that past history is not relevant, so to speak, Ah. unless you've complained of coercive control in the past. Mm. I always say get yourself a new doctor. It's a shame, but if they've polluted the well there where your normal doctor is, you might need a fresh start with someone who understands you and probably not even in the same practice. Mm. Somewhere mm. else. So they, it's a, you do have to think about going to, when you see a psychologist, these notes could be subpoenaed, but there are laws coming in mm. that are going to put restrictions on whether you can read subpoenaed psychologist notes. For other people. For, yeah. yeah. Uh, so that, and mental re- medical records too. But they're not in yet, but that is something to consider. Yeah. But like you've said in the podcast this one or previous, the court doesn't look down on you getting mental help if you're going through a divorce. Mm. That's normal. Well, it, it's actually better than normal. Yes. So, you know, they you'll often see in the reasons for judgment that the court will say something like, uh, Mrs X has had a challenging time post-separation and her mental health has suffered, but she is has been seeking appropriate counselling mm-hmm. and uh, maybe or may not be, has been medication compliant. Mm-hmm. So you're taking your medication that you're required to, and that's just how it is. Okay. If you go in there denying you've got a condition, mm-hmm. then the courts, if there's ample evidence and you're in denial, they're going to assume you will continue to be in denial and that your mental health issues will negatively impact on the children. Right. Yeah, so that's, that's so it's a worry fine about that balance. with the kids. Yeah. So it's a fine balance of making sure that you are aware of what your shortfalls are, aware of what needs fixing, mm-hmm. overcoming that fear of your ex, seeing your notes, but getting yourself better. Yeah. And that right. if the, if your ex is saying, well, I'm going to subpoena your psych notes and I'm going to be able to read what you've said, mm. know that you Not know, anymore, hopefully. Yes. Yeah. And and the judge can do a thing where they seal it. What's that? Yeah, they do. So when a subpoena is issued to someone, then there has to be a request to the court to allow people to look at it. Right. So you can subpoena and them, then, but then you also have to ask, ask to look at it. permission. And, right. some, it, and the courts can block access to records for, to the other side. Maybe only they'll let the... ICL read them, mm-hmm. or it might not be admissible. And ICL is independent children's oh, lawyer. Gun, yeah, yeah, independent children's lawyer. So yes, so it's it was being used as a tool of coercive control. Mm. But yeah. there should be laws coming in that will help. Yeah, that. I'm not sure. To be honest, I have to admit, I don't know if they're in this set of laws. Yes, or if they're coming. If soon. they're coming through, through we'll, have soon. we'll have yeah. a look. We'll have a look. Once yeah. the update is complete, we will do an episode on yeah. the new updates. But we just want to wait till it actually happens because mm. it is a bit arbitrary at the moment. We're going to start in May. Yes. And then we'll have a it won't start to get some case law about it as yes. well. So the other thing with coercive control after separation is, you know, if they are really trying to get in your head, you may feel guilty going to the gym. You may feel guilty mm-hmm. getting personal training. You may feel guilty looking after yourself. You know, they may say you're so selfish, you go to the gym. Yeah. I heard someone say that their ex complained to a friend that she went to the gym for an hour a day and, and that it was so selfish. And that had a psychological effect on her, mm. uh, thinking that she was a bad mother because she chose to look after herself for mm. an hour. So make sure you're checking in and and make sure that their attitudes and the nasty words and stuff they say mm-hmm. to people isn't stopping you from getting 
healthy and staying happy and looking yep. after your health because you really do need your health to get through this. Yes. And you don't care what they say anymore because yes. you don't care for them. As yes. You're not in love with them. No. Uh, you need to then get your own standards and look after your body as though it were someone you really cared about. Yes. Because you should really care about yeah. yourself and ultimately you will. And even if you don't this. care about yourself, pretend you do and mm. it will slowly become real. Yep. So, okay. So the next one, mum, is making jealous accusations. Now that, <laughs> that obviously, if you're in a coercive controlling relationship can happen all the time. Oh, you smiled at that grocery man. Oh, the the air conditioner guy uh, was looking at your legs. How did that waitress know your name? Yes, all of that kind of stuff. Have you seen that jealous accusation continue into oh, the legal post-separation Absolutely. abuse section? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, it's a nasty thing too because obviously you are free. Mm. You're moving on. You you will be free to date. Mm. And so you'll find that like, oh, you've had this many people over at your house for the night. I don't want you to have these people over at your house. Don't don't go wandering up or they will ring up the ex of the person you're dating or they'll ring up the person you're dating or oh, email gosh. them. So they get very involved. Yes. Um, and they will always accuse you of having relationships, particularly if they've been having them. <laughs> yes. And I think if you find your ex is doing that and you've had that all the time, you've just got to remind yourself you're out of the relationship now and it doesn't matter what they say. Yeah. And yes, they may have little jabs at you in affidavits or they may have they jabs at you in legal letters, but you've got to just remind yourself that it's a reflection on them. Yes. And they're just doing that to control you. Yep. And control the narrative in the court. Yes. And lastly, number 12, regulating your sexual relationship. How on earth, mother, can that continue after separation? Well, it happened. But ha- ha- can you but give us some examples? On, like staying over someone's place overnight or forbidding you to have someone at your place overnight, that sort of thing. Yeah, because we've had people write in and said, my ex says I'm not allowed to have anybody else in the house. When I have the children with me, it's only got to be me. And I, I was thinking, well, well, obviously you could just say, well, that's none of your business. But yeah. people in their head think that they've still got to follow those rules. And they worry too because p- particularly if you haven't got court orders, mm. that those that arrangement you've got might stop mm. if you have a new partner. And and is it or bad? Like rubbish. Mum, is mm. it bad? Because you look at the way, I, and Mum and I were having this talk, I, I was telling Mum about how people date now on Bumble and Tinder. <laughs> I'm shocked. And I don't know if I should have said those words and I don't recommend them, but I was telling Mum how people now date and it's kind of not like the old days where you caught just one person at a time. People tend to be dating like four people, five people. Well, my definition of dating anyway. It's not friends with benefits, but it's a situation. Situation ship, I think is the term oh my gosh. where, you know, but but I'm not judging, no. but but I'm saying that the, the way people do relationships these days is different. People can have more than one sexual partner. Like, like yes. it's I definitely go and see a doctor, make sure you haven't got STDs and be safe. Mm. But can that be used against you in court? Because I know a lot of our members and listeners freak out that everything they do is somehow going to come back at them in an affidavit or in family court and be used against them. So how can... <laughs> The coercive control person regulate someone's sexual relationships through the family court. Well, I have seen people's Tinder profiles and things printed out, attached to an affidavit. Holy moly. Yeah. But did the judges care? Well, do you know what? Someone your age might not. Yes. But given given that a lot of the judges are my age or from the generation just after, yeah, they they can't help but apply their own their olden days. Old, well, I I was shocked when you said that. Yeah. To me. Yeah. And so they will look at you as promiscuous and lower well, moral, unchild focused, maybe. So so because someone's on Tinder, you think sometimes the court might think you're unchild focused. Maybe. Yes. So if he makes that, if the other person makes the narrative and the judge sort of sees that, mm, yes, mm. they might say, well, you know. So, and that's more coercive control because, because then you've got to worry about not having a profile that your ex can see. And you know what? The longer the court goes, the longer that, that control goes and, then you, and the happier the controlling person because is. Because you still don't have a relationship. That's right. They're still managing you. Yeah. So what you're basically saying is, 
what we're not judging. And I think it's healthy to move on and, and have new yep. relationships. Absolutely. As long as you're safe and, and mentally well again and you can mm. recognise the signs of coercive control so you don't fall into the next yes, one. Yes, don't let the next one do it too. But what you're saying is that can be used against you in court. A coercive control post-separation abuser will find that stuff and put it in an affidavit. Yep. Even though it's perfectly normal in society, the court is the average They're age of older. a judge is what? Oh, probably 50, 60. So they don't even know what? Tinder is. Really. Oh, yes, I think we do. Well, they don't, but they don't understand how it works or what the understanding is or how many people use it. I had, I had a matter once where I had to go before, uh, was, it was Judge Lynn and I, and my client had met a person online and that was like shocking. And she was, and uh, they met up and then she wanted to go to America to have a holiday with this guy. Yes. And the, her ex, filed an application and blocked her at the airport. So we had to go to the court to get her permission to go overseas for this boyfriend. Uh, he ha- His affidavit was full of, of all of her her profile. It was all, oh, RSVP there. Yeah, yep. yeah. And, uh, and I can remember the, the judge looking at it and shaking his head. And I my submission was, Your Honour, whilst the manner in which my client connected uh, with her new partner is not something that society as a whole would do, hmm. they have been nevertheless connected. She's got freedom of movement. She will be back, da-da-da. Now, I think that submission back in 19, probably 1992, 1993, hmm. compared to now, it, it's just most people meet yeah. online. Yeah, that's so right. So it's the times have changed. But the judges, but the judges haven't. haven't really, yes. Yeah, so, so what we need yeah. to, so what you're trying to say to people is if you are, and like we said this with any social media, mm. and I guess dating apps are social media. I know of some people who've had a Tinder app. Uh, you can pay to have a private profile oh, can you? so that if you do have a controlling ex, they can't see it. Be discreet. But is be that discreet. The, that's the way. And be discreet. While you're in the family court process. I think because so. Because it can be used against you, which is such a horrible thing. Yeah. And generally, like, you might feel that you're being controlled uh, if you think you can't have your partners at your house. But there is evidence that that it can be a bit of a shock to the children, mm. particularly if that partner doesn't turn out to be a long-term partner. So having children exposed to a number of different potential partners when they're in their heads, they're still getting over the separation, can mm. be quite damaging. And but not child most focus. That's right. I think most of our listeners know they're not going to yeah. do anything to shock no. The children. No, it's usually their exes that are doing that stuff. <laughs> so so what we're trying to say is yeah. that, that, the, that moving forward, if you have ex- escaped a coercive controlling mm-hmm. situation, you're out, you're free, and you want to go and explore, you want to try new things, you want to, you know, even mm-hmm. though that dating, life. that dating world is a nightmare. Yeah, just FYI, <laughs> um, you do you don't want to damage your case. Yes, you don't want to put more speed humps in the way of you getting what is best for the children. And if it means you have to sacrifice going on those apps or doing it in a discreeter way, then mm. maybe you do. And again, everybody's situation is different, and and it may feel like they're still controlling you. And to an extent, you've got to play the game. Yep, and and think of it this way: you're making smart decisions yeah. uh, to get the right outcome for your mm. children mm-hmm. and it's only for a little bit longer, guys. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's it, there is a tendency, I've been there, you get out and you think, oh, thank God, I'm yeah. free. Yeah. And then whenever the other person uh, wants you to do something that you don't want to do, you, you feel like, oh, well, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do free. the opposite of yes. what you told me not to <laughs> yeah. do. But however, the, until the court case is over, try not to uh, have those reactionary and inflame things. the yes, situation that's right. because the court, the judges have forgotten. I think if they've ever been there, how raw you can be after a separation, mm-hmm. and they'll often look at emails and texts from just after the separation yeah. and attribute uh, motives to you or even uh, a, a character characterization of you, which was only the you in the immediate post separation when you were in shock. Mm. And and I think you're going to shock even if you leave. Yeah, yeah, mm. you do. Don't forget with coercive control, often the controller, the coercive person leaves mm. because if you're starting to wake up to their shenanigans, yes, they will find someone else. Yeah, and and then you're left in shock. Yeah, you think well. 
hang on, now yes. I've been dumped and I did everything he or she wanted. Now, we've gone way over time oh, and in, in episode, the part one of this, we talk about what they've said in the Psychology Now article about what you can do. I'm just going to quickly touch on it because I don't want to end on that. And if you have listened to this, remind yourself again. So it's psychology today. They said, one, write down the thought traps. Okay. So if you've been gaslighted, jot down when you think you're being too sensitive or when you wonder if you're losing your mind and what happened that made you feel these things and then go talk to someone. Okay. And number two, speak to yourself positively. Okay, so if you catch yourself saying, oh, you're a loser or you're such an idiot, think about where the idea came from. Is it just them repeating something they've said to you 20 years ago in your head? And remind yourself that everyone makes mistakes and treat yourself like you would treat your bestie, okay? Number three, get connected. Go and get the support you need. If it's a good lawyer, if it's a good psychologist, it's good friend base, good family, okay? If people keep doubting your stories, don't sit around them in this moment. You want people who believe you and you want people who have got your back. You don't want to spend time convincing those people as well as the court. It's a waste of energy. You just going to be using your energy in the wrong place that matters. Number four, find a therapist. Like I've said, go and see a psychologist and look for someone who specializes in trauma and understands domestic violence. Examine your acquired habits. Are there things that you're doing because they've expected it of you? And are you still doing it after you've left? Make sure that you're trying to undo all of that stuff. So we talked about they expect a hot dinner every night. You don't have to do that now. You don't live Mm -hmm. with them. You don't have to iron their undies. You don't live with them. I don't know where my iron is (laughs) and I'm married. I know. I asked to borrow it. Mum's like, I don't know what that is. Okay, number six, build protective measures, okay? So there are going to be forms of post-separation abuse. We've talked about Mm -hmm. them today and in episode uh, part one. So what can you do to protect yourself from those? And one of the biggest things is legal abuse and they're going to be looking for anything to use against you. So put some safety measures in place. Because legal abuse and coercive control are family violence. Yes. Yes, that's right. It's family violence. And then lastly, avoid that self-blame cycle. Accept that that none of this is your fault, okay? So yes, you chose them to be with them. Yes, you chose, but they didn't They didn't say to you when you went to marry them or to live with them, oh, by the way, I'm going to control you. I'm going to put you down. I'm going to decimate your self-esteem. I'm going to basically rule your life. Do you want to marry me? Yeah, then yeah. If they said that, it is I'm your fault. I'm not let you see your family and <laughs> yeah, friends. You, you would have never agreed to that. Mm. And coercive control does not happen happen all at once. Okay. So they wait. That's their choice. That was their decision to use that stuff against you. It is not your fault. So accept accept it. And it is probably the hardest thing you're ever going to have to accept, but it's time to start believing in it. And mum, if anyone wants to read that article, I'll put that in the show notes. And whilst this wasn't particularly fully a legal episode, Mm. I think it's important for people to know because there's so much social media stuff about gaslighting and coercive control, but no one's talking about the after separation. Yes, absolutely. So I hope this helps anybody. Please write into us if you've got any questions or any, you know, stories that can help us build more episodes. And if you need any help, you can reach out as well. We're on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, YouTube, and of course, you can find us on the potty, or you can email us at the divorce www. No, you can email us at the divorce course podcast at gmail.com. One day we'll get our domain sorted. <laughs> we do actually have the domain. I'm just haven't right? got the time to put it all together. I can't get stop thinking about the word potty. Potty. Yes. Everyone calls it a potty, mum. Okay. Because we're Aussie and okay. potty instead potty. of podcast. Okay. It's just lazier and easier to say. So sorry if you've had to yeah. listen to this. And I am so sorry if any of this has touched a nerve. Please call 1-800-RESPECT. If you're in danger, call triple zero. If you need someone else to talk to, you can always call Lifeline. And thank Keep you, mum, safe. for Keep sharing safe, your wisdom. Guys. Yeah. That's all. Thank you. Okay. Bye, guys. I'm so wise. Okay, let's go have lots of tea and chocolate. Okay. Bye. Bye. If you found this podcast helpful, we'd love it if you could rate, review, and subscribe. By doing so, you are spreading the word to help someone else just like you. Lynn would like to remind you that this podcast is general advice only, and you should always get legal advice in relation to your particular situation. And remember that the Australian laws may have changed since recording.